I wish I could take every one of you to Panera or to Starbucks or to Water Street and disciple you. I wish I could. I wish Bonnie could take every lady in this place one at a time and go through discipleship, but that's physically, humanly impossible. What we can do is encourage you to get together with some of the, what, what you will see, some of the normal, healthy believers of Calvary Bible Church. Because anyone who is normal and healthy and has any spiritual maturity has been called by God for life to be doing what I'm showing you this morning. I'm just showing you in a group setting what is to be going on all over this church in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Discipleship is rarely in a group. It's almost exclusively operated in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Now, Jesus trained the 12. But if you notice, he was taking, you know, three off here and one off there and meeting with them there and answering a lot of questions. But he didn't just do it in a session. He did it for three and a half unbroken years. Most of us can't devote 42 months to discipling someone. And so what we do is we go with one person for an hour, a half hour or so at a time. So if I was meeting with you, this is our second session. Last time when we gathered, I did session one about why we even need to do this and, and what the place of the Word of God is. But in Romans 15, I'm going to show you basically what I call the signs or the vital signs. In fact, in first service, I was talking about my blood pressure. We have so many doctors at Calvary. And I said, I don't know what my blood pressure is. I can never remember it. I always have to write it down. I said, something like 90 over 60. And a pathologist said, you wouldn't be making it very well this morning. It's 120 over 80, please. I said, okay, 120 over 80. But if we were taking your spiritual pulse and blood pressure, you know, they measure against... The, what's normal. You know, when they do all those blood tests and everything else, they give you, you are this and this, and this is, this is what normal is, this range. What I'm showing you this morning from God's Word is what normal, healthy, mature believers, if all of your systems are operated and God started those systems, this is what we look like. And, and I'll take you through as far as we get this morning. Number one, Believers display compassion for believers who differ with their convictions. That's a sign of spiritual health and maturity and, and of being a, a believer who is normal. We don't make everyone line up with whatever our uh, fully come to conclusions are about how we're supposed to operate. We do what we believe is right and we nurture others, but we have compassion. And, and I'll go through that in just a minute. Secondly, mature, normal, healthy believers display the hope that only God can produce by his spirit. They have that. It's from God. It's through the Holy Spirit uses the scriptures because the scriptures are the way we know God, the way we know his character, the way we know his person, the way we know his truth, the doctrine of God. And so we will look at those in the, in the fourth verse there. And then next, thirdly, the third mark of a, a mature, healthy believer is uh, they display a united direction. In other words, they live in unity. Uh, they know the direction the Bible has said, and they're united in that direction. In fact, the whole uh, book of Acts shows, uh, there's a key word that, that I will show you in the book of Acts. This united, uh, in fact, you probably have heard the word in the book of Acts. It's called one accord. How many of you have ever heard of one accord? Let's say that together. I do, this is discipleship. I make them talk to make sure they're listening. I say, what word did I just say? Very good, see? And I would hear that at Water Street. Uh, and if I didn't hear it, I'd say, you're buying the coffee the next time because it costs $5.41, you know? Um, <laughs> They display not, this verse says, with, with one mind and one mouth. They don't just believe it. You see it displayed in how they behave. And so we talk about that. And then fourthly, they display a passion for Christ, not self. You see, remember Paul said, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ, but I'm still alive. And, and what that's about is a mature, normal, healthy believer will have a passion for Christ. Everything else, they're not as passionate about. You understand? That, that's why people come to us and they say, you're different. 
I mean, Paul did a 180. Salvation transforms us so that, you know what the hymn says? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow what? You catch that? Strangely dim. Nothing else Nothing else comes up to the height of our passion for Christ. And, and we'll look at that and explain that. And uh, fifthly, in this passage, uh, mature, healthy, normal believers display a connection to God. Uh, in fact, this is what's so important. I mean, if, if you went down on the stadium or whichever way on stadium to, you know, we have a lot of car dealerships all along here. And if you went and looked at a car, and, you know, you looked at the sticker, and you looked at how shiny it was, and you color the paint, and you opened the door and smelled it, and you never bothered to get the keys and, and to actually see if the windows work and the wipers work and if it starts and if there's even a motor under there. Wouldn't it be disconcerting to think that you have a car and to pop in there and stick the key in and nothing happens? And you lift the hood and there's no motor. Yet, we have a whole group of Christians that, that we have never checked to see the reality of whether all these systems work. How about driver's ed? What would you think of someone going to driver's ed and all they did is watched videos of good drivers talking? And saying, I love to drive, I love the wind in my face, I love, you know, I love to, to look out all the windows of the car, I love the feel of the seats, they move, you know. And you never let them, even in a simulator, you never let them drive. Wouldn't that be scary if you gave them a license and a set of keys? Yet that's what we do in Sunday school classes across America. As long as they'll listen to the lecture, we figure they know how to drive. Christ didn't think that was sufficient. He only lectured the crowds. The individuals, he pulled them aside and asked them all kinds of questions and interacted with them to make sure they displayed a genuine connection to God as the source of hope through the Spirit. And we'll, we'll see that in verse 13. Sixthly, and this is, this is so neat, healthy believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you're full of the Holy Spirit, he produces the fruit of goodness that fills their lives. Did you know you can know this morning if you're truly born again? Because if you're truly born again, God is doing something. It's kind of like um, there, there are people that have broken in when Iraq, you know, after the Gulf War I and II, there were people that broke in and, and to the military warehouses and got some of these military gear that, was, uh, that had a degree of radiation to it. At barrels of, you know, uh, waste and stuff and they dumped it out and took the barrel home. And what happened is, long term, they began to have produced in their lives the fruit of being around radiation. Now that's a negative illustration, but they didn't see it, they couldn't smell it, they didn't, I mean, there's no taste to it, but just that presence of radiation slowly caused them to be sickened. Did you know in a positive sense you can't have the very spirit of the infinite God move into your life without him producing a byproduct? And that's called the fruit. And the one that Paul talks about here in verse 14 is goodness. Seventhly, uh, healthy believers experiencing personally the truths of God, which is experiential knowledge. And what I'm going to show here is that it's not enough to know the facts. It's whether or not you have experienced them, whether or not you have tested them, whether or not you have drove, whether or not you have started, whether or not you know how to. We got out of the elders meeting Thursday night. I don't know, it was about 10 o'clock or 9.30. And I looked over on the back we have a driver's ed school going on here in our parking lot, 24-7 almost. There were cars out there and cones, and there were people directing, and they're all from the apartments, and they use that as a little driving course, and they have the, you know, they're driving around the cones, and they're backing up and everything. Can you imagine someone saying they know how to drive, but they've never done any of that stuff? You wouldn't loan them your car. Yet, this 
This is what the early church did. The early church ran a, a medical surgery clinic where everyone was trained in surgery, not just in the classroom. They actually had to go into the op for it in the OR, and they actually worked alongside of someone else. That's what discipleship was. Do you experience personally the truth of God? Do you have experiential knowledge? Then finally, uh, believers understand and use God's word, and uh, that's in ministering to one another. Uh, basically, healthy believers feed in the doctrines of God's word and display spiritual strength and growth. So look in your Bibles, and uh, I wouldn't go through all those points with them, but I did it for you, so you thought we were going somewhere. Uh, I would just go to the first one, which I'm doing right now. Look at verses one through four, and I read it with them. Um, and actually, if you're meeting with someone, you don't know very much about them. They might not even know where things are in the Bible. And so I helped them. I said, do you know where Romans is? And I show them the index you know, and how to find it on the page number, or I'll, I'll show them, you know, basically you know where it is if you know the layout of the Bible, and you show them that, and you get them to 15, and you actually have them working with you. I read a verse, they read a verse, and you actually, you discuss. See, it's not a lecture. Discipleship is a dialogue. It's, it's going together. It's leading them down a pathway, holding their hands spiritually. And so in verses 1 through 4, what I'm looking at with them is, what, what it means to feed, uh, what doctrines are, and how you display spiritual strength and growth, because that's what this passage is all about. So we read it. Uh, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproach of those who reproach me fell on reproach you fell on me. Now, verse 4 is your turn. Okay, you're, you guys are the, you're on the other side of the coffee table. Remember, you have to buy the coffee if you don't participate. And so, uh, let's all, whatever version of the Bible you have, let's read verse 4 out loud together. You ready? One, two, three, go. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Whoa, we all had about the same amount of stuff. Okay, so that's what this passage is about. So the next thing I do is I go through the, the verse with them and I show them, I point out words. And I say, hey, what do you think this means? The, the people who are strong. So they're strong Christians and they're, if they're strong, there are weak Christians. And I say, do you understand what a strong Christian, what a weak Christian, you know, the Bible defines that. And then I say, this, this is so important. One of the underlying messages of the scripture is we're supposed to be pleasing God, not ourselves. In fact, the underlying motivation of a godly believer is they're not in this to please themselves. And let each of us please his neighbor. Now, I might break into at that moment, uh, do you remember the little story or little song you had to learn, in, you know, five day clubs, good news clubs, or VBS or something, which went like this? Jesus and others and you, what a wonderful way to spell. There we go. Hey, we've got someone else who's in my club. Did you catch that? It says, Jesus and others and last place, you. What a wonderful way to spell joy. See, that helps you see the priorities of life. Look, look back at what it says in uh, verse 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good. Jesus didn't come to please himself. See, that's, that's essential for us to understand uh, the, the uh, message. Let me get back here to where I was. And then, leading to edification. Edification has to do with building up. It's kind of like what you're seeing going on uh, the stadium on ramps, you know, they keep dumping dirt and pushing it down and moving it around and doing stuff. They're building it up, uh, getting ready for uh, everybody to go to Costco and, um, or whatever. I don't know why they're doing it. I just assume it was that. For even Christ did not please himself. But then look at this. For whatever things were written before, this is the time I say, what do you think he's talking about here? He's talking about the Bible. What Bible did Paul have? 
Well, how many books of the New Testament were by the time he wrote this in maybe 55 AD? And you say, how do you know he wrote it in 55? You get a study Bible. If you want to disciple someone, it's imperative that you have a good study Bible. And you know, I've told you my favorite is MacArthur's study Bible, but there are many study Bibles. But I would get one that addresses all, especially the, the theme and message and the, the dating of each book that answers any alleged discrepancies and, and what you would come up with when someone's talking to you. But I say all scripture, everything that was written before were written for our learning. And this is a time that, that you would talk about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and all scripture is profitable for doctrine. That's what's right. For reproof, that's what's wrong. For correction, how to get right. And for instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. See, what's right, uh, what's wrong, how to get right, how to stay right is what the scriptures, it's for our learning. That we through the patience, did you know reading the scriptures cultivates patience? Just reading God's word as a believer connects us to a God whose spirit indwelling us produces patience. That's why if you're a regular reader of God's word and you're really meeting with the Lord, people should notice that you are more patient the longer you live. You can read the Bible and be impatient, but it means that, that you're either bulimic or anorexic. You're spitting out right away or you're not you're, you're not digesting food. You're, you're just avoiding it. You and I, through the scriptures, have patience and comfort just by us interacting with God, and all of that produces hope. And so those are the things that we're going to talk about when we're going through this. And so, number one, healthy believers display compassion for other believers who differ with their convictions. And, and their concerned about others more than themselves, and that acronym, joy, Jesus, and others, and you, is, becomes operative. So I actually take the time uh, to uh, go through, where did verse, I didn't even print out verses one through three, so let's just look at it. What does it mean in verses one through three? Now you can look at your Bible instead of the screen. Those who are strong, and, and actually say, does the Bible describe what is a strong and a, a weak believer? And, and I always disciple with a notepad. And, and the reason for that is everything I say, I'm writing down. And what's interesting, number one, it encourages them to write stuff down. Number two, it helps you to be able to reinforce past points and also it keeps you from, you know, perambulating around a pool of veracity, which means you just talk and don't say anything. Uh, but what, what is the weaker brother in this verse? Look, look what it says there. Um, those, those that are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. So we have the weaker and the stronger brother. What, what is the difference in the Bible? Well, basically, the Bible says the weaker brother is the one that has the stronger convictions. In fact, um, he also has the most. <laughs> it's like he has a conviction about everything. Everything. Don't eat that. Don't eat. Don't go there. You shouldn't do that. Oh, they're just, they, they just, the weaker brother has is just surrounded by, it's like he's just, he's walking on this little narrow, you know, trying not to do anything wrong, trying very hard for many reasons. In the Bible, in uh, 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 and Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 14, all of these talk about the background of these people going to their idol temples. And, and those idol temples had animals brought in that were offered to a false, demonic, satanic god, and then they were slaughtered by the priests, the blood used in the process, and the meat was the freshest meat in the city because they had this parade of sacrificial animals to Zeus, and the priest ran a little side, you know, market where they were selling all this stuff given to the gods to support it themselves. So, if, and usually people brought their best, even the Jews brought their best sacrifice, and so the pagan temples. Now, now think about the implication. You know, here in town, 
uh, is a pagan temple. And this temple has inside of it usually horrific stuff going on. Most pagan temples had some degree of immorality somehow connected to them. But they had connected to it the best meat market in the city because they had a constant stream of the freshest and best cuts of meat that were coming in the front door. And what happened is people that used to be involved in this get saved and the weaker brother wants to stay as far away from that place as possible because he knows what goes on inside that temple, all the sensuality and immorality and occult and everything. And all of a sudden, you know, the weaker brother is as far away from that place as possible and he sees one of his brothers in Christ going in and coming out of the meat market. He's horrified. He thinks, well, what if they went through the meat market and into there and maybe they did something in there, you know, and, and that was, oh, the devil is there and all the evil and the immorality and everything else. And actually, they're just a thrifty shopper and they, they got the, you know, steak special. But the weaker brother, not only, I mean, both of them agree false gods are wrong, immorality is go wrong, um, you know, sensual sins are wrong, they believe that. Uh, the occult is wrong, but this, this stronger brother realizes that you can go to the meat market without being involved in false worship, sensuality, and the occult. This one won't even get near the place. Now, with that in mind, look, look what happens. Um, the weaker brother has the stronger convictions. Don't go near the temple. Don't buy any meat from the temple. How do you know that there might be a demon attached to the meat you bought at the temple? The stronger brother is, is mature. He, as it, as it talks in Hebrews 5, you know, and whoop, 5, 14, well, actually 12 to 14. Uh, and by the way, some of you are saying, how did you know that's in Hebrews 5? Because I went to biblical counseling. That's how I know. And that we had to mark that verse a hundred times in the course of two years. But they are stronger because they are exercised biblically. They, they exercise biblically. Instead of just thinking that buying meat at the market is wrong, they look in the scriptures and they say, does God say that? What does the Lord say our liberties are? That, that we're in the world, we're not of the world. And, and, but, now go back to what the original... Um, they display, verses 1 through 3, compassion. See, a mature believer, this, uh, this happened to me in my life. I, I, was, uh, I grew up at Lake Lansing Baptist Church, Conservative Baptist Church, Lansing, Michigan. Um, I've told you before, we went, I went there before I was born. You know, my parents never missed a service, you know. I came, I think, the day I got out of the hospital. I mean, I was there all the time. And both of my parents were alcoholics and got saved. Both sets of my grandparents were alcoholics. Everybody in my family I knew drank. My parents met in a bar. I mean, all kind, I could just tell you stories about the, the terrible byproducts of drinking and alcoholism and drunkenness. So when my parents got saved, anything to do with alcohol was absolutely wrong. And so I grew up in a family that basically anybody that drank was lost, unsaved. I mean, because everybody we knew that was lost drank. And so you just add those two together, and it just became, you drink, you're unsaved. So I go on my very first missionary trip to, to risk my life going behind the Iron Curtain, taking Bibles into communist countries and Muslim countries. And I get assigned to a team of seven Europeans and one American, me. And, and we're sitting there in the training center, uh, and they briefed us and shown us the map and loaded our car, and they say, now you have today to spiritually get ready because you might be captured by the communists and they imprison you and often, you know, do all kinds of stuff to disorient you. They couldn't harm because you're an American or German or whatever, but they do try and scare you. And so they said, you need to get fortified spiritually. So go take your Bibles and the training center, this beautiful, it was in Europe, you know, and you just go out and sit and we'd read and everything. So we all got out to our training center and I sat with my Bible and they sat with their Bible and I heard <laughs> seven long neck bottles of beer. 
they're all drinking away as they're reading the Bible. And I immediately thought, oh, no, I'm on a team and they're all unsaved. <laughs> and so a mature, normal, healthy believer, if, if my teammates had been this, what they would have had is this for me. Uh, as soon as those seven Europeans saw my horrified look, they began to carry their, their alcohol with them everywhere they went just to tease me. I mean, they, they would set it on their Bible. They would carry it in their pocket. They just, and, and they, would, uh, they just would just try to drink in front of me all they could. Now, do you think that, look at what verse 3 says. Those who are strong enough, are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let us please our neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Christ didn't please himself. So what are we supposed to do when someone believes something's wrong and we know it's not? Well, Paul gives us the answer in, in those passages I told you about right here. You know what Paul says? You can read Romans 14. He said, I won't drink again in the presence of someone that thinks drinking is wrong. I will, I will never again touch alcohol. I'll not eat meat or drink wine while the earth exists so that I don't offend. Is that the attitude norm? No. Do you, do you know what today? Do you want to know what 21st century response is? If you find someone that believes something that you do is wrong because they, they believe from the Bible it's wrong, you immediately call them a name right here. You say, you are a legalist. That is not, by the way, that's a, if you know anything about theology, you would never do that because a legalist is someone that thought that they could earn salvation by keeping the law or the Sabbath or the diet or whatever. No, no, no. If they want to be proper, uh, nobody should call anybody a legalist except a Roman Catholic working their way to heaven through the sacraments or, you know, some person that, that is involved in a, a putting someone back under the law like a lot of these messianic type groups are saying you've got to observe all the law or you won't go to heaven or someone that says you have to be baptized. Keeping the law to go to heaven, being baptized to go to heaven, or keeping the Jewish system to go to heaven is legalism. Most people are not legalistic. What they are, are externalists. They think that by observing something externally, it makes them more spiritual. And you can address that. Uh, and basically, finally, the team leader with me says, did you know Martin Luther drank? I said, well, I never thought of that. They said, well, did you know that, you know, and, and they just went through and they said, we never get drunk, but we're from a European culture and, and, and we just grew up with alcohol and all of us, we, we know that drunkenness is wrong and everything else. So that, that was this, compassion. Now it's, it's time for communion, but at this point with my one-on-one -on -one thing, I'd say, why is compassion so important? And I would say, what was the most frequent emotion of Christ? And they'd say, not sure. I'd say, do you know what the most frequently recorded emotion of Jesus Christ was? Compassion. And I said, this week, and I would take him to Colossians 3, I says, you need to clothe yourself Colossians 3 says, verse 12, put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. It's a choice. This display as a mature, normal, healthy believer only comes as a choice. You have got to want to be Christ-like. Jesus doesn't come in and move all the furniture and we're going, don't do that, don't do that. He, by invitation, you know, every time I see one of those two men in the truck things, they don't go around and break into houses, I hope, and take everything. They only go by invitation, and they'll move your stuff. Jesus, by invitation, will come in and say, I will make you 
display my emotion of compassion. And it's what you do when you find someone that has stronger, well, where did it go? Well, I don't know where it went. But when you find someone that has all these rules in their life that you don't have, instead of you guzzling your long neck in front of them, you, you don't even tell them you drink. And you find out about them, and maybe through Bible study, you could lead them where you have come. Or maybe you might learn from them. So that's the first lesson. And, uh, and for us this morning, it's a reminder of how vital it is in the biblical record to see how much the lecture, this is a lecture, I'm lecturing, how vital it is to get into a one-on-one -on -one nurturing discipleship relationship because Jesus said, I'm sending you in all the world to make disciples and once they become a disciple, to teach them how to observe. And the only way you teach someone how to observe is you show them how God has led you through his word and then you work with them until they understand that point and then you go to the next one. And this is what spiritually healthy mature believers look like and I can't wait till the next point. Let's bow together for a word of prayer and I'll invite the uh, elders and deacons and our uh, godly men to come and pass communion. And with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I would just like to ask you a question. I, I would ask this at Water Street. And I wouldn't even make them close their eyes. But with your head bowed and eyes closed, ask you a question. Number one, and you can answer silently, do you believe that Jesus left you here to be his disciple, to follow him, to learn from him, to obey him and to please him. In your heart, do you believe that he left you to be his, his learning, following disciple? And after you answer that, the second question is, when Jesus said, I am leaving you here to be my servant in this world, to go into all the world and make disciples and to teach them to observe, do you think that you have a part in that? Do you think that the Lord saved you because he has a, a bigger purpose in life than you just making it through and to the end and surviving and paying all your debts and, 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 and existing? Do you think there's something bigger than that? Something you're supposed to do for him? So thirdly, have you come to the point in your life where you say, Lord, I know I am here to lead other people to Christ and to train them how to follow you. And I want to learn how to do that. And I want to ask you for strength and grace and, and your spirit, because it scares me. And I don't think I know anything. And I don't think I can do it, but I want to do it, because that's what you called me to do. So I'd like to ask you this morning, before communion, how many of you here today say, I believe that the Lord has called me to do discipleship as a believer, and I want to learn how to do it and someday sit across the table with an open Bible from someone and nurture them into following the Lord like me. If that's you, you say, I want to be a disciple. I'm not just a disciple. I want to be a disciple maker because Jesus asked me to. If that's you, with heads bowed and eyes closed, hold your hand up above your head so I can see. Hold them up high. Wow, more of you than first service. Okay, you can put them down. Let's pray. Father in heaven, that's my desire, that's your desire, and that's the desire that's just been expressed by all these dear saints this morning. I pray that you would stir our hearts to look into your word a little differently every day and to experience what it says and understand it so that we can communicate it to someone else. And that's only possible because of what we're celebrating today, that you died for us, that we should no longer live for ourselves, but unto you that loved us and gave your life for us. So at this communion, we renew our gratitude for your saving us by dying in our place on the cross. Thank you for the bread that portrays your body, that there on the cross became our sin, so that we would never face the wrath of God because it was satisfied, because every sin on you was laid. 
Thank you, O Christ. Bless our communion with you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.